Good morning. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Good morning, Eddie. This Hey, Internet, my friend. How you doing? I'm good. I'm great, Eddie. Awesome. Good to see you again. Oh, same here. Hey, it's been a minute. Yeah, I was sick. I've been sick. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing back now. Okay. Getting all right. Together. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, oh, all right. Get better soon. We need you. <laughs> I know, right? I'm, I'm back on it. I'm back on it. I've been uh, yeah. I've been doing options on on the video. That's been very well for me. So it's yep, yep. on the video, but so I'm back in it. So, but All I right. want what you learn with these uh, vertical spreads. I, I can't get it with these vertical spreads. I'm trying yeah. to see what got going on now. Okay, we'll be talking about those. We'll, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good deal. Good deal. Okay. You still you still down over there in uh, in uh, Florida? Florida. Or, uh, what, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm born and raised here, Florida. I'm not. Uh -uh. <laughs> well, I can deal with a little rain, a little hurricane, scare, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I can't okay. give it this sunny weather. The beach. I go to the beach a lot, so I can't yes. give it up. Yeah, that's it. It's worth it. It's worth it just being down there. So cool, cool. Beans. It's so crowded here, though. It's so crowded here, Eddie. Yeah. I mean. On a Sunday, on the weekend, it's like, oh, where everybody going? Yeah, but I, I remember everybody's moving down here to Florida. <laughs> the older people, you know, the older people, retire people. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. All right, because you... We, we look we look into it. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah you just how... like, you're just a skip and a hop. I know, I know. It's just a few hours down the street from me, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... Yeah, definitely will. Yeah, we oh, we come down there a lot to Fort Lauderdale. That's where uh, that's where I live at Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's an easy hop. Uh, every once in a while, we get some uh, really low fares, like forty bucks, I think. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Forty mm -hmm. bucks from Atlanta, and uh, you just fly down there for the weekend, come back. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Forty dollars where, Eddie? Forty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Spirit. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's forty dollars. You can catch them. I heard you 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 do it on a Tuesday or something like that. It's like a yeah. Tuesday special. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what we do. Yeah, forty bucks uh, one way, mm -hmm. and and uh, you can't beat that. Sometimes they have uh, seventy dollar fares to New York. So from from ATL. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, you can you can do that. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Mar Marlon, you should do that if you, if you like to get out. But just mm -hmm. to confirm, did you say spirit or yes. you're talking spirit? I don't know if spirit. I I don't know if I do spirit. Uh, I take well, my chance. <laughs> I, well, well, here's here's the deal. For me, it's a it's a weekend getaway, and I've got time on my hands, so I don't care. I mean, they're they're late more you know more often than not. <laughs> yeah, don't go but, if you're uh, going on a business trip. Don't go if you're yeah, going on a business trip. Yeah, if you have to absolutely yeah. you know be there yeah. on time, right? You know, yeah. Then uh, you know fly Delta. I see. I see. Right. Yeah. yeah. But if you, you have get to get away, it's cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, if you want to, you know, you just kicking it. You're just looking for a weekend getaway. Spirit is fine. I don't do Southwest because of the free seating. Uh, but you know, Southwest, they uh, yeah, uh, meh. You know, but I don't like South Southwest anyway. So I do Spirit or Delta. Yeah, me too. Ed. Me too. So, Business, yeah. I do Delta, but free trip, yeah. I go to um, North Carolina a lot. I catch mm -hmm. a Tuesday special at Myrtle Beach. Yep. Cheap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Real good. Okay. Cool. Well, let's get started. Uh, today is what? Uh, Sunday. It's no Saturday, actually. Saturday, March 23. Uh, yeah. Special day uh, for someone in my family uh, celebrating birthday. So wish her happy birthday over there. And um, uh, let's see. Sunny day out here. The late rain has stopped, at least, you know, for the weekend. So we're feeling good. Feeling good. So welcome, everyone. Welcome, Deborah. Welcome, Tony. Welcome, uh, Junior Lewis. Uh, Michelle Hall, good to see you again. Uh, Gail, as usual, always good to see you. And uh, my man, Marlon, Marlon, Marlon. Mar what are you doing later today, Marlon? We might just get together today. I'm in the mood for beer, so, you know, I don't know. We will see. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, are you I, in town? Yeah, I'm in I'm in town, but I, I won't be able to break away today, man. I gotta take care of something, but we can definitely do something soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I'm open. So whenever, whenever, just just hit me up, man. Absolutely. Cool, cool. Let's see who else got the camera on. We've got Anthony, 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 somebody, yeah. Yeah, here we go. 
And then, uh, let's see, Erica. How was Erica? How was Michelle? All right. Well, good to see you guys. So today, I think the biggest question uh, that I posted out there is, uh, you know, how are we hustling? So I'm going to, what am I going to do, actually? Uh, let, let's let's build an agenda. How about that? Let's build an agenda. First and foremost, everybody over here knows about options, right? And uh, you know how to do calls, you know how to do puts, you know how to sell, you know how to buy, you know, all, all of that good stuff. But uh, is it enough? Is it enough just to know them? Uh, that is a question because we've been hustling a lot and, you know, a lot, a lot of people are just screaming, they make the money, then they lose it, then they make it. And they, you know, so what's the, what's the deal there? And I, and I think what we want to do here is a couple of things. We want to, we want to supplement, we want to supplement our usual income. So if you get paid, you know, every week, every other week, whatever, or you're a business person, right? You do your, your books at the end of the month and you decide, Hey, uh, my proceeds minus my uh, uh, my expenses. I'm left with something, so that's that's my paycheck. That's what it is. Yeah, that's that's how business is done. What you receive minus what you sell and what remains. That's your net income in stocks and options. We trade contracts, right? Options contracts. We leverage shares. So instead of trading just shares, uh, we we leverage those shares a hundred times, right? Yes, yeah, that's that's right. You had that a hundred times, one hundred x. How about that? Do you know any other business where you can leverage anything one hundred times? Anybody? I don't know. I don't know. So this one is one hundred times for you know a fraction of the price. So for example, if Apple is selling for one seventy and you want to buy a hundred shares, uh, you don't need seventeen thousand dollars. To trade right so you would need a hundred you need a uh, hundred times 170 which is about let me hit that number sounds kind of big actually 100 times 170 that, that's right seventeen thousand dollars to to trade uh apple and you try and make a dollar on that uh, for it to go to 171 and then you make 100 bucks now nah, it's old school man don't do it oh you can do it if you want but you know hey there's a better way so what we talk about here is capital efficiency Right. Capital efficiency is when you're a business person and you've reduced your cost or you've discovered ways to make your money work for you harder. That's what we're trying to do with options. So, for example, in that uh, in, in that Apple scenario, instead, what I would do is I'd spend maybe you know, $800 to $1,000 and buy one contract, uh, wait for Apple to move up uh, $3, $4, and I make my... Uh, well, how much would I make? Uh, and so that remind me, if, if I made... Uh, if Apple went up three, four dollars, let's say four dollars, and I bought one contract, approximately how much should I make? <laughs> Delta fifty. I'm giving you some more information. Delta fifty. So, oh, four dollars. It went up four dollars. Yeah, four, yeah. You should you should make about two two hundred dollars, right? Yeah. Delta fifty. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so you can see the math. You know, Antoinette is going to spend a thousand dollars. Buy one contract on Apple and it goes up four dollars, so she makes two hundred dollars. Well, why not four hundred dollars? It's because the delta, yeah, it's one one little trick, one little Greek over there that we use. Uh, delta is the rate of change of premium. So all of that is discussed actually in my class options with Eddie. We break down all the Greeks, uh, and there's there's just a few Greeks that we concentrate on, but we, but I will teach you. I will teach you all the Greeks. There's there's the strike, there's the B, the ask, there's the uh, delta, theta, vega, rho. A lot of people don't talk about rho, which has to do with taxes, right? Uh, effect of taxation on an on a, on a options contract. Uh, we talk about gamma. How do you do a gamma play? All that kind of stuff. And then at the end of the day, we break it down and say, what really is important? Of all those things that you learned, what, what, you know, what do you really care about? What should you care about as a beginning trader? And... <clears throat> excuse me and 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 that's where you get started then you look for consistency once you find your strategy and it's making money why do you want to change it right why do you want to change it so i have discovered a strategy or many strategies that actually help me in my daily trading so i trade a lot i trade a lot this week for instance for instance i made 17 trades 17 trades and I posted that in my group about you know what I was doing, what kind of trades I was doing. It was actually a bad week for me. Actually a bad week. So I don't want to make this sound as though it's all nice and rosy. 
and uh, all that good stuff. But but how bad was it? How bad was it? I lost two hundred and eighty dollars. That's how bad it was. Is that bad? I don't think that's bad. To me, that's a win. It's a win, Deborah. What do you think? I can't hear you. I can see you saying something, but uh, you know, is is that a win or is that a loss? What do, what, what do you think? She she can't find her mute button. That's a Trust win. Me. That's a win, right? That's, that's a, a win. win. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a win. Going going uh, closing down the week with a negative two eighty uh, for me that's a win. But is that the objective for most traders? No. Because my regular week is usually in the positive, and there's usually a few zeros after that. Usually a few zeros after that, every week. So when I see negative 280, nah, big deal. Not a big deal at all, right? I'm smiling. I'm all the way at the back. I'm telling them, yeah, hold the check until Monday. <laughs> hold the check until Monday. We'll, 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 we'll cash it on Monday. But uh, you want to be there. You want to realize that in this business, you gain some, you lose some, uh, or you break even. And the idea is to be on the positive side most of the time. So people are asking me over here on the side church, what's what's your regular uh, income? And I, I'm, I'm usually shooting for a few thousand every week. But I'm a seasoned trader. I've been trading for a very, very long time. And so that to me has become normal. When I say paycheck, I pay myself about two grand a week just from trading. This is my side gig that I do two, you know, a couple of hours a week, right? So what happens is, is that all I make the two grand? No, that's just for the effort of two hours a day. That's what I want to pay myself. And then the rest of the money just goes into either building up my portfolio, growing up or investing in other things, saving for other things, buying dividends and not dividends, buying ETFs and and uh, shares. So I do also buy shares. I don't want to say that uh, shares are not important, but um, uh, I usually, you know, when I go shopping, th those are the kind of things that I buy, you know, just, just shares. And I have a new strategy that I'll be talking about in my class very, very soon about how to pay yourself without lifting a finger. Just go to sleep, wake up in the morning, or you know, check check your portfolio balance at the end of the day or at the end of the week, and the money's in there. It's called dividends. So how do you pick ETFs that pay you without a whole lot of effort, zero risk, zero risk? Well, not zero, but the the the, the risk there is that the ETF share value will go down, but you don't care for as long as the ETF is paying dividends. Uh, why do you care that it went down a few dollars? You don't. Historically, the market has gone up, 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 up. Anybody wants to contest that? No. A couple of years, it went sideways. It went down, then sideways. It's from 2021, from 2021 to 2023, the market just kind of went sideways. Let me share my screen here. And uh, let's see, I'm going to delete this gadget here. I'm going to share my, my SIM trading account on, uh, and somebody tell me when you see it. Uh, let's see, let's do a preview there. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully you should be able to see it. Yeah, pretty sure you can see it. Yeah, we see it. Yeah, you, you look at my, what, TD Ameritrade? Yes. Yeah, TD Ameritrade, yeah. So so this is a, this is the S&P 500, uh, and I'm going to just zoom out here to about three years. How about that? Three years. I don't have enough data on this side. Uh, I can probably bring up a browser that will show me, uh, will give me a better view. But uh, let's see, it's taking its time firing up. And by the way, what uh, what kind of tools do I use? I use uh, Trading View. If if anyone is familiar with Trading View, that's that's what I use. I also use Think or Swim on two brokerages. I've got two main brokerages. One of them is uh, TD Ameritrade. The other one is uh, Schwab. Everybody knows Schwab, right? Hopefully. 
So this is actually a better view. Trading view gives me better view. Let's go and give you the maximum that, uh, space over there. But what I want to do is show you all. Uh, let's just go five years. How about that? So this is this is the COVID. This is 2020 right here, March, uh, February, March. That's when it happened. That's when, you know, everybody now learned about what it was. But how long did that last? Just a very short time. But the market has been going up, 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 up. And then up until 2022, when it started going down, and all of 2022 and part of 23, it was just down. And then towards the end, uh, actually not towards the end, in March 23, it started going up. Got a little bit of a hiccup, and now we're back on that trend. So guess what? I am projecting, uh, this is Eddie projecting, this is not financial advice, by the way. I am projecting at least 6,000 in the next few months, right? That's what I said, 6,000, right? 6,000. Uh, we are at 5261. We are talking about 800 points. What will it take to get to 6,000? That's a huge figure, right? It doesn't sound real, even. Does it sound real? What do you think, Antoinette? Just sounds kind of uh, like, man, 6,000, really? You... No, it's, it's, it's realistic because you got to remember we got the bull run coming. We got to, to have, we got a lot of stuff happening in the next 600 days. So, Ex exactly. Coming up, so. I think so. I think so. Yeah. So we're looking for 6,000. And what are you going to do uh, right now? You're just going to wait for the market to come down so that you can go up. Well, good luck. If you're waiting, good luck. If you're, you know, you're thinking that we don't buy on the highs. Well, it's a different story, different story. If, as a, as a day trader, swing trader, we try to buy on the low and sell high. So naturally any technical trader would be trying to wait for these, uh, for these candles to come back down and, and form a uh, you know, sort of a, a upside down V or a tent, and then they would start getting up. Well, that would be too late. If you're doing shares, yes, go ahead and wait, right? Um, might be waiting for, for, for a while. But if you're, if you're trading options, we don't care whether it goes up or down or sideways, these strategies. Uh, as a matter of fact, these days I've just been hoping and wishing that it just slides, you know, does its thing and just coasts the whole day. That's that's what that's how I've been making money, moving sideways. I'll give you an example. So you ask me how I make my money, right? Uh, here's the hint. Yesterday was what day? Friday. Uh, well, actually, let's just go to Thursday and Friday. Um, Friday was the twenty what? 22nd. So this is the day started right here. Let me draw a line. But is that about right? Yeah. So that's Friday from uh, 9 30 and uh, ended, ended over here. My thesis, my thesis when I wake up in the morning, look at the markets and all that, is I try to figure out where is this thing going. Right. When I say thing, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the market, SP 500. Remember, S&P 500 represents, what, 500 companies, right? This, so there's about 500 or 503 tickers in there. The reason there's three tickers extra, because some of them have got A and B shares like Gugu. Gugu with a A or Gugu without an A, something like that. And there's, there are a few others over there. That uh, So it's about 500, give or take. But... The the idea is to figure out the easiest way to is, is to figure out where is this thing going. You have to be very very good. Let me change that time. You don't have to be very very good. You just have to be seventy percent correct most of the time. That's an oxymoron. Saying seventy percent and then giving most that's once finite, once kind of no. So you you have to be right about seventy percent of the time. Is that is that good? Is that better? Yeah. So. Using that knowledge of where the the market or the, the these numbers are going, then you start to define your strategy. So you know that I've always loved selling. Uh, Antoinette, if you remember from the first 15, you know I love selling, right? And selling is easy because all I have to do is just figure out where this thing is not going to go. Sell either above that or below that. Wait for premium to decay. And I'm done. I also I also did a statistical study, and I, I've known this for a long time, but I wanted to to keep track 
I mean, I'm inside of a challenge right now where I'm keeping track of all my trades. I've always kept track of trades. Uh, I have a very special thing that I use to do that. But I've been paying attention to how much time in the trade am I? And I and I saw that my average time in the trade these days has increased to one hour. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but previously, my average time was about 30 to 45 minutes. 30 to 45 minutes inside of a trade. It has increased steadily over uh, to, to just about an hour, sometimes even an hour, 15 minutes. And I also discovered that previously, the longer I was in a trade, the more I lost. But now things are flipping. The longer I'm in a trade, the more that I get. But that increases risk. And, and there's so many ways of, of looking at that. Here's just, just to break it down further, I sell, and let's say, for example, I sell a spread. If I sell a spread in the morning, so this is Friday morning, and I sell a spread up here, right? So I'm just going to give some examples here. Uh, let's say I sell a spread at the 50. Now, what did I do Friday? I think I did 55. So on Friday, I did 55, which was yesterday, 55, 60. So right about there. And let me break that uh, break down that trade. So I did a CCS. My thesis was that price was not going to reach that point during the day at all. That was my thesis. So that was 55.60. So I sold premium there. I went heavy. And notice that my thesis played out very, very nicely as price decayed all the way down here. And I was in the trade for about an hour and sold. Sorry, I bought back. Right, so when you, you you sell to open and then to close the trade, you have to buy. You have to buy back. That's the uh, you have to BDC. So so that's what I did. I, I I bought it back. But look at what happened the next few hours. The next few hours, price started you know going upwards, and if I had held on to my CCS and I checked the value, I saw that it never got threatened, but the value went back to where I bought it. And to me, that is not good. I am so risk averse that if this thing is not performing, especially after holding it for these many hours, what do I do? I dump it, right? I don't hold on to it. So I have a policy. I see profit. I take it. I don't mess with it. I don't gamble about it. I don't, I don't, no, no, there's no hope. It's no hopium. You, you, I'm in business. So once you make the money, you take the money. You don't think of yourself as a manager at a convenience store. Does the customer come in, wants to buy something, hands you the product, you scan it, they give the money, and then you're asking them, do you really want this? Do you really want this or do you want to think about it? Anybody know that business model or have that business model? You don't do that. No, you tell the customer real quickly, have a nice day. You keep the money, close the cash drawer. But a lot of you are holding on to that. You're, you're asking the customer, do you really want this? I'm not in the business of asking the customer whether they want that after they've bought it. No. Once, once you've got the options, you've got the premium, you've seen it, you take it. That's what you do. Then you go get another customer or you tell the customer to buy something else. So the value of the contract increases as the price moves towards the spread. We all know that. That's that's the regular standard procedure with any kind of spread, whether it's a vertical, whether it's a uh, call, whether it's a credit spread or whether it's a debit spread. As the price moves towards the spread, the value of that spread is increasing. So I dump it and what do I do? I either play it again or, or do something. That's how I've been making my money in just under a couple hours. Uh, that's one of the strategies. Another strategy that I used to use is calls and puts. So I used to, you know, look at uh, other things in the pre-market to see what's happening, what's changing overnight, and then use that information to guide me as to what I need to do during the day. Well, if I don't have a strong enough movement, guess what? That thesis will not work so well because I'll probably see green very, very briefly, or even for you know, a bit of time, and I think this is the way it's going, and then boom, what happens? It reverses direction, and all of a sudden, that green has gone. There's something called IV. We've talked about IV crash um, extensively and seeing the effect, and how you can use the IV to guide you into 
where to buy, where to sell. So that's deeper in the class, uh, especially for credit spreads. Uh, you you want to use that you know to your advantage, but to make money you have to first understand how to do a spread. That's number one. You have to have uh, superior risk management, right? Superior risk management, meaning that if it starts shaking a little bit, you've got the guts to just yank it out, close the position, and rethink it. It's okay to do that. You don't argue with, you know, I've got a five hundred dollars stop loss. It's now at two hundred to two hundred fifty, and yeah, let it get to five hundred, and then hope this thing stands around. No, we're past that game. You don't do that anymore. Why? This market has changed. Simple as that. So we're changing with the market. We're no longer tolerating greater losses. I posted in my group the other day that I am now looking at a hundred dollar loss. I'm testing that these out on SPX. For the longest time, I have said that if you have a $100 stop loss on SPX, it's the same thing as saying, I tell, as telling SPX, brother, here's $100. Is there anything else I can get you? Can I get you? Can I refill your water? Do you want lemon with that water? What, you know, what's the deal, right? $100 stop loss on, on SPX is nuts. We don't do that. Yeah. It's going to take your money and then come right back and smile at you and say, oh, I was just kidding, but I got you. I get to keep you hundred bucks. <laughs> That's SPX. So instead we have to be a little smarter and decided we're going to change strategy, right? I can't be giving you hundred bucks every day or 200 bucks every day. Right. And then you, when you, when you give me money, you give me just a hundred. No, that's that deal is not working anymore. So we have to move to, we have to lean more towards what I call defined risk, defined profit. Defined risk, defined profit is simply a strategy that you can employ where going into the trade, you already know what your maximum profit is. Yeah? How many businesses do you know that have that? Right? This is one of them. You, you have to know what your maximum profit potential is. And are you going to go for it? Okay, that's number one. You also have to now know your maximum risk, right? Maximum risk or maximum loss. So to give you perspective, let's go with the spread because that's what we're talking about today. What if I decided to trade SPX and I wanted to see, I, I wanted to figure out how to do that. So for, for those of you looking at this for the first time, you're looking at Think or Swim, uh, this is a platform that is, uh, you know, one of the best in the industry. If I were to go for any other one, I'd probably go for Tasty Trade, uh, made by the same guy, same people. So this is this this is my weapon of choice, and and so I will teach you how to do that, how to use this uh, this weapon of choice. But I'm looking at SPX uh, or the S and P 500. Uh, looking at the Monday expirations so on Monday, this is going to be zero DTE. So I'm going to be selling. That's why I'm choosing March 25, and this is demonstration. So I'm going to choose here vertical, and let's let's take a look and see what's happening. First, I need to understand where do I think this thing is going to go. For that, I am going to look at the chart. So this is a full-fledged example of I'm making a decision, um, or rather I am uh, analyzing. So I'm doing technical analysis. By the way, we do technical analysis Another type of analysis that you can do is fundamental analysis, right? Fundamental is where you start looking at uh, who's the CEO, uh, who's in the parking lot directing traffic. Uh, are, are these guys really making a good quality product? Uh, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a foot long sub really, full, you know, is it really 12 inches or is it 11, 11 and a half? Anybody remember that discussion <laughs> with Subway? They got in trouble for selling a less than 12 inch foot long. Uh, I don't know. Uh, fundamental analysis, you're looking at uh, what the revenue is, the market capitalization, utilization, all of that good stuff. And you're trying to make a decision, is this a healthy company? Well, not that we don't care about it, we do, but we do it this much, very, very small, because it's important to us and that's how things get onto our watch list. Again, that's a deeper discussion where we talk about what makes up your watch list. How do you 
how does it qualify to even come in on your watch list so that you, you you're pulling up a chart on it so you know make sure you join my class to to understand that and so you're not just having junk stocks on your watch list you have quality stocks that have a certain potential that you're looking for deeper discussion over there so here we're going to do technical analysis on this chart and i'm on a 15 minute by the way the best chart to to do a uh, an analysis is actually the daily time frame. So you're looking at nine months worth of data over here on this uh, chat that I'm that I that I have up on S and P, and I am looking on a daily time frame. So each candle kind of represents one day. That's one session, and I'm trying to figure out where with what's the upside on this. Well, I don't know. I have no idea, right? I don't have a very good idea of where this thing is going. Why? Because we are at an all-time highs, ATH, right? We, we, we're, we're familiar with uh, with the with all-time highs uh, being that as a stock progresses in its journey, it has got lows, it's got highs, and historically, we keep track of that for the last, I don't know how many years, I need to get that number, uh, you know, one of these days. But we, the highest we've been on SPX is 5261.10, which was... Thursday, and we want to figure out, well, we did pull back a little bit, and we want to figure out on Monday, next week, is it going to go up or is it going to go down? I, I don't know. There's two possibilities. It could go up or down or sideways, make that three possibilities. But as a seller of premium, what I want to also identify is what are the possibilities. So let's let's go back. Let, let's use the example of our uh, of a call credit spread. Let's imagine that this will stay below a certain point. That's because of the trend. There's, there's two things that we're looking at here. For one, we've hit the all-time high, we've pulled back. Second, we have a gap right below here that we need to fill, right? and then gaps are very, very special. So we talk about gaps a lot in class and how to work with them. Uh, so there's a gap over here that we think that you know, we might try to hit it. Uh, yesterday, we actually did try, but uh, failed to completely close it. So if you look on the 15-minute, uh, the gap I'm referring to is uh, this one from you know right here to approximately, I would say approximately there. So it's a five-point gap, give or take. Now, why did I choose the week uh, as opposed to the body? Uh, that debate can, uh, can actually go many ways, right? Uh, that debate can go many ways. Some people will look at the gap from the body to the body, and that's accurate. Uh, some people will look at the gap from the week uh, to the week. I think that's more accurate. So both are accurate. I th the reason I think it's more accurate is because when you're working with options, we've discovered that that week is very significant. It tells a huge story. So why ignore it when it comes time to work with gaps? That's my reasoning behind it right? Uh, you might have an opinion, uh, and that's cool. So we, we've got a five point, um, and, and that, I think that's significant. If this was less than a $1 you know, gap, I'd, I'd call that gap as good as field. Would you say that? Yeah, as good as field. But when it's five point, then it, you know, it starts becoming significant. So let's go back again here and, and think. If we were to, if S&P were to rise up to the top, it would start challenging 5261. Uh, and I'm going to point to a number here that you should pay attention to also. And that is the 49.75. What number is that? That's the ATR. All right. ATR is average true range, in case you're you know hearing it for the very first time, ATR. And that represents the movement, the average movement over the last 14 days of a particular underlying. Okay. The underlying here we're referring to is the SPX. So we are at 52.34 here. And if I did some quick math here and said 34 plus, uh, let's just run that up for easy math and say 50, could we could we potentially see 84, 52.84? Remember this number is plus or minus. So we could potentially see an 84 upside or we could see an 84 downside. Well, which one is which or a combination of both? Uh, don't sweat it too much. There's something else I can help you called implied volatility. So right now, the implied volatility, again, 
if you follow my mouse and put it over here and I'm going to go all the way here closer to the top right you can see implied volatility for uh, estimated implied volatility for March the 25th is plus or minus 24 right again I like rounding numbers because these are not exact so 24 points uh, every once in a while we're going to have another value here called MMM which is the market maker move and that gives us information about what this broker thinks uh, this price will do. And it's I think it's fairly accurate. We've been using it. So a combination of three things, the ATR, the market maker move, and the implied volatility. The implied volatility kind of actually is more important to us because uh, it responds to something called gamma and vega. So if I actually changed my layout over here to include... Uh, a few more things here. There's other calculations that go into calculating how these implied volatilities arrived. So gamma and vega are used. And based on what's happening in the market, these two numbers are super, super, super important to calculate that. There's actually a formula, really long formula. I don't care to teach that. Okay. But just understand that behind the scenes, that's what's going on. Do I need all these numbers on my screen? No, nah, I don't need them. Yeah, they're just confusing. They're just blocking what I need to see. So I don't I don't use, uh, or rather my view will not have that. So I'm going to just uh, remove those items. Push OK, and we're good. We're back to just Delta, Bid, and Ask. So plus or minus 24 points, give or take. Let's redo our math here. It means that from whatever the price is, our upper boundary could be could be 24 points. So let's do 34 plus 24, and that gives us what 58. So 52, 58 is right about right about there. Yeah, you know what? That's just too difficult to remember. How about we just do 52, 60? Is that good enough? Yeah, 52, 60. Uh, lower boundary would be obviously to 34 minus uh, 24. That would be 10. So we're looking at a lower boundary of 52.10. So let me go ahead and remove this drawing since I'm not using it here. And then I'm going to draw a rectangle around over here. How about that? So if I say that this is the expected range of movement, Right, so I'm building a plan over here. This is my trading plan that I'm building. I'll probably do the same thing on Monday. So if if this is my my range of of uh, play, it means that if I want to sell, if I want to sell premium, ideally I need to sell it above fifty two sixty or below fifty two ten. Why is that? Because I want to sell where price is not going to go. Keyword here is not. Not where it's going to go, but where it's not going to go. That's the idea between uh, behind uh, spreads, credit spreads. So there's two possible theses here that price action is going to be moving downwards or price action is going to be moving upwards. So I need to build two theses at least. So let's, uh, let's build a thesis here that price is going to be uh, moving downwards or staying below 52.60 and see, is there any premium up there? Is there any premium? So if I go now to my options chain and I'm looking for 5260, I see that I have 50 cents worth of premium. Is that good enough for me? That answer is no, right? It's too low because I've got certain minimums. I've got certain standards that, that I employ to decide whether to sell or whether to risk. So 50 cents worth of premium implies that there's a $450 risk per contract or per spread. It's good, but it's not good, right? It's, it's, it's worth it. I don't know. It's worth it if you could sell these right away and forget about it and decide that best case scenario, I make $50. Worst case scenario, I lose $450, right? Right. And you have to decide what are the chances that I am going to that price is going to remain below sixty. When I say sixty, I'm actually saying below fifty two sixty. So if the chances are great, then well and good, it's a good enough risk. If not, 
I need to go closer here to the money. That's what we say by going closer to the money, uh, the 52.34 to get more premium. But I can't make that decision just yet until the market opens. All right. So once the market opens, then obviously these numbers are going to be different and I will have better information. I try to go these days. This is, I haven't, uh, uh, you know, officially announced it yet to my, to my class, but uh, I, I usually go for at least $1, at least $1 in premium. Right. So one dollar in premium is what I'm going for, which means that I more than likely would 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 might go for something like uh 55, 60. Right now it's showing that it's uh, trading for 90 cents. The likelihood that this is going to be a dollar on Monday, uh, very high based on price auction. But I, I will put in an order for it and you know get picked up. So why one dollar and not another number. It's because I'm trying to balance risk. I'm trying to make as much as possible in the shortest amount of time. So I figured that if I sell a little higher, then I, I'm i doing some risk management there or risk mitigation saying that if this thing goes against me, uh, it won't have a very good chance. Or I have a better chance of withstanding price action coming towards me. Let me give you a little bit more context. In the morning, there is high volatility. Man, I, there's so many concepts over here to, to talk about. Uh, but there's very high volatility between 9.30 and 10.30. And that volatility is, is usually affecting this premium. So high volatility means I get really nice premium. Low volatility means that this premium is going to decay. A lot of big words for new people. So don't worry about it. Just, you know, when you come to class, we'll break it down and see how, what, what goes into the making of, or how do we price options contracts? Uh, that's important. But how you're trying to make money is that you're trying to sell for, you know, $1 here. I'm going to just push it up to one on $1. And then within an hour or less, you're going to buy it back for an amount less than $1. So something to the tune of 30 cents, 40 cents, you know, give or take, right? You, you, I'm, I'm, these days, I'm not even waiting for it to go to 20 cents. Even though if I had waited, I'm all, almost all the trades, almost all the trades that I did this week, if I had waited to the end of the day, they would have expired worthless. Uh, people all over the sh internet are shaking. Worthless? That means no money? No, no, no. That's a good thing, guys. That's a good thing. When a, when a, when a credit spread expires worthless, you get to keep all the premium that you received up front. So that's not a bad thing, right? But the amount of stress associated with holding a spread from, let's say, 9.45 all the way to 4 o'clock is tremendous. That is a huge amount of stress. And I'm, I'm anti-stress. I don't like stress. So I like to take stress off the table. I like to take risk off the table. So what I do is once it has sufficiently decayed, sufficient here is relative. It is relative to my trading plan. My trading plan says I will let it go 50%, for instance. Let's just make something up. But that's pretty close to the truth. 50 to 60%, then I take profit at that point. So my maximum potential profit is 100%, which is $1. So 50% would be 50 cents. You with me so far? So how do I make money uh, if I'm just making 50 cents? So to somebody who doesn't know options and uh, we're talking about 50 cents, they're like, dude, you guys do all this for 50 cents? And says, no, no, no. So you're trading multiple contracts. And remember that because you're using leverage, 50 cents is actually what? $50. So just to give an example, if you're doing 10 contracts, that's equates to about $500. Yeah, with me, 500 bucks, 500 bucks. If you're doing 20 contracts, that is uh, what, $1,000? Yeah, $1,000. But that increases your risk huge. You, you don't want to trade that many contracts. Uh, in fact, I tell my students, you shouldn't be trading more than three contracts, three to five contracts. The industry average for small accounts, now small is relative, 
most people will tell you don't risk more than 5% in one position. So whatever 5% of your total portfolio is, that is, you know, you have a good chance of recovering a hit. So for me, 5% is a significant. So I can do, I can, I, I can do quite a bit, uh, but I don't because I understand the risk. Even, even with the ability to do more than 5% per position, I understand that there's common sense and there's, you know, there's what you can do and what you should do. So I follow what you should not can do. So risk is a big thing. I don't trade a huge amount of contracts just enough to meet my objective. So you can see that uh, 50 cents is great. I think it's good for me. And besides, if I'm trading a couple of times a day, it means that I can hit it twice and go home with about a thousand give or take uh, almost every day, almost every day. So, so let's see how we do that. Uh, go back here to the options chain. I wanted to demonstrate the risk on this. If I push confirm and send, I'll bring this up here so you can see it front and center. I am selling, I'm selling uh, this spread here that we defined, which was the uh, 55, 60, and I'm selling it for uh, $1. So I'm getting a profit here of $100, but you notice that the max loss here is 400. So we were talking about uh, defined profit, defined loss. So this is your maximum profit potential here is 100. You cannot get more than 100 on one contract here. Right, we understand that. And the most that you can lose is 400. Because once you get the 100 back, $100, they, they don't ask for it back. No, they you go ahead and keep it. Yeah. But the 400, they will they'll pretty much take it out of the account because there's a something called buying power. So you notice that the buying power effect, in order for you to be able to trade these, you have to have at least $400 in the account. Ah, I take that back. You have to have more than that. But the buying power effect, they will hold $400. The, the amount of money you need inside of your account is, you know, obviously usually more than $2,000 to have a margin account. I think any brokerage these days, you need more than, more than $2,000 to have a margin account. Uh, on top of that, more than $2,000 in order to do spreads. I want to say that's true that's still true but somebody somebody was was my chat uh uh let's see it's possible that that is there's some brokers that are different i don't know anyway but uh in in general that's what it is you need uh, you need two thousand dollars in the account to make it marginable and uh make it spread capable and options as well so this is an example of a defined risk trade where you know exactly what, what uh, you can get and how much you can lose. There are other types of trades that we talk about in class, like debit spreads, where you even reduce, you, you further reduce the risk and the potential for making, say, $500 is still, is still there on using very, very little money, but it's a little harder. Remember, low risk, low reward. High risk, high reward. That's the way it goes, most things in life. So if you're trying to be inside of the trade for about an hour or a couple hours, this is a good trade. Yeah, this is a good trade. So this one describes how to take advantage to the upside, You know, uh, assuming that you go 55, uh, 52, 55 to 52, 60, and that's called playing in the fire, but these days we kind of need to, you know, be close to the fire, but not that close. And then if I want to do a put a credit spread, then I'd be selling below 52.10. So let's go back to the chain here and see, do we have any money at the 10 level? So 52.10, 52.05, again, we have about a dollar. So you've got about equal weight on, on both of those. I think that 10.05 would be challenged faster than the 55.60. I think that would be challenged uh more the reason i think that it will be challenged is because of this gap so we've got this uh, small gap over here that we that we identified which starts right about there all the way to that's that's the gap that that we're thinking that could cause a little bit of a challenge so 
Uh, yep, I think that 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 gap. If you were to go with with a spread uh, that uh, took advantage of your uh, of price moving upwards, I think price it will tend to maybe come back down over here, maybe fill this gap, go back up. I don't know. We'll see. There are lots of things to consider. So we look at many things. We look at futures. We look at uh, other symbols that affect S&P you know, strongly. We look at things like Apple. We look at Microsoft. Uh, we mostly look at technology. So we are, we are always interested in something called NQ. NQ is the NASDAQ futures, which have been driving this market quite a bit. Uh, the reason for that is because NQ is tech heavy. It's got some of the heavy hitters like NVIDIA, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Meta, Amazon. Who did I forget? Yeah. Is Tesla's thing these days? I don't know. Look at their stock. The stock is now at 170. Are they are they a deal these days? Anybody, anybody think? What, what, what is it? What, what do folks think about Tesla? Is it still a good company? Fundamentally, I think it's kind of busted. Technically, it looks like the chart is confirming that it may be a subpar stock. So, uh, yeah, no. it's subjective. It's all subjective. But um, all right. Andy, so, what go time are you? What time are you getting in? Are you getting in like as soon as it? market opens because of the volatility and you're trying to capture that so i try i'm usually trading in a high volatility environment which is, means it's between 9 30 and uh 10 30 but i don't get in right at 9 30 no when i'm selling i want to when the market opens i already have a thesis formed and i usually have a bias already right so i have a bias and my bias can change as that time goes, and it can change two, three times. You know, uh, so I'm usually building a, th a bias, building a thesis, abandoning it, so I don't get stuck on one thing. And that's that's another thing that traders should do. But to answer your question, am I going at nine thirty? That answer is no. Right? How much time do I wait until I get in? It could depend. If I see the opportunity at nine thirty, nine sorry, nine forty five, nine forty, I go in at that time. But the idea is to capture as much premium. The best time to capture pre uh, more premium is when there's high volatility, and then you wait uh, for that volatility to come down. Hence, the implied volatility uh, reduces or crashes. That's what you know, that's the time that is used, and then you can buy back at a lower price. A lot of times these days there are. This macro news coming in. So that also guides my activity. It means that if there's FOMC activity, for instance, at 2 o'clock p.m., like this week on Wednesday, guess what? You can get extremely good premium even at 10 o'clock. But one hour later, that premium is still right where it was. Just, we, you know, we looked at that on Wednesday. If you got in at, say, $1.20 premium by 12 o'clock, that premium was still about hovering about 110, 120. It's as though time stands still just waiting. But if you notice on, on uh, what, what is like Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. Bring up, uh, yeah, bring this up here and see whether we can go to 15 minutes on Wednesday. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, what date was Wednesday? Is this is this it? Yeah, Wednesday over here. So let's do let's do a replay here and let's start with uh let's let's do that. How about that? So this this is uh, this is Wednesday, and we're gonna go down here to the one minute. And you notice that uh right at about the time that that the Powell started speaking, the Fed chair. Uh, is that it? Is it playing? No, I don't want to. 
actually, yes, let me go ahead and exit and let's go back to replay from Wednesday. This is a little tool that you can use. Uh, well. uh, somebody remind me, what date was Wednesday? The 20th. 20th. Okay, so I need to move it back further. The twentieth. All right. Yeah. Let's let's do that. Let's uh, let's just see how things uh, played out. So this is uh, we, we've moved the clock back to Wednesday, approximately uh, two o'clock p.m. This is when uh, Mr. Powell was, was talking. Mr. Powell is uh, the the Fed chair, and we're going to see how things played out. Is it is it playing? Do you, uh, how do we? supposed to play uh it's supposed to move it's not moving why is it not moving does it not play in one minute i don't know Let's see whether we can do that mm. all right okay. anyway it's 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 supposed to, to to move here and we're supposed to see how price action happened but once once you have that activity you notice that we have some huge spikes right so we had some really huge spikes and uh, that could make or break your strategy if you're still inside of a trade so erica there to answer your question that is relative but in general on calm days like say thursday and friday where there's no fed activity then in general i'll be in there usually but before 10 o'clock all right about 10 o'clock, yes. Um, just before you turned it off, I think I mm -hmm. saw it down at the bottom of the screen. Normally, it's at the top where you just press that play button, but it was yeah. at the bottom. Okay, let's let's try that again. So if we go to, so you're saying go back to Wednesday, and somebody said it was the 20th, right? Yeah. Is that That's it, right? Over there. So I do need, first I need push replay. And then check the date. So 1359. And then where where's the play button? At Just go bottom. straight down to the bottom. Oh, so. right here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah. So you can see the price action on uh, uh this is this is what was happening on Wednesday as the price moved, or as uh, you know, the Fed announcement took place and they announced the rates, yada yada yada, and all that. Tell me, is anybody able to trade this kind of action successfully? Well, I did trade it, but not a lot of people can do that. Uh, you have there's a tremendous amount of risk, so you can see that this is how the chart played out on Wednesday as the announcements were being taken. I wish there was a replay on. I wish there was a replay on how the options contracts performed. There probably is. Right, there probably is a way to to do that. I, I just stopped it uh, right now, but uh, you can you can on Think or Swim. I guess I guess you could go to Think or Swim and, and watch the replay as well uh, using on demand. But you can also see the you you can also check to see how a particular uh, contract has has worked over time. So I'm going to send this one to Blue. And I'm going to go to my chat over here. So now I'm on blue and I'm on nine days. So this is a representation of how that particular contract, the 5560, has worked over time. Okay. This is, and I'm, I'm only going back until too much. Let's see if I can get some more data on it. Yep. There we go. So this is, this is deep and you need to understand how to use it, how to, how to use it to your advantage, how to, what is happening by looking at it, what does it even mean, right? What does it even mean when you're looking at this uh, contract and how it has behaved? So that's deep, too deep for a Saturdays with Eddie. And, uh, you know, we can always discuss that on uh, either power evening or power morning one of these days. But 
you want to understand how to get to these and how to interpret all of that. So uh, long answer to your question there, Erica, but uh, you understand that when you're trading spreads, uh, credit spreads, you get in as early as you can reasonably. Once you get the price movement and where it's going, the momentum, and then for other types of uh, defined spreads, the best time is usually around 11.30 to around 2 o'clock in the middle of the day when nothing is happening, right? When nothing is happening. Nothing means that you don't have a Fed announcement, you don't have rates being announced, you don't have other macroeconomic news being delivered or shared, and it's just slow. So for swing trades, the best time is right about, you know, any time after ten thirty, usually around eleven, eleven thirty. That's that's a good enough time. Uh, time. Uh, the reason being twofold. Number one, if you had a thesis that price was going to move a certain way, you now have confirmation. Right. That's number one. Second is the market will already have shown you the price action, so you don't really need to guess. You you can see how what it's doing, and that will either confirm or negate what your thesis is, and you are just as needed, and you go. Now, what, what what I also want to caution everyone is don't get stuck up on whatever decision that you make the previous night or in the morning. Don't do that, right? Be ready to make a decision and make it, but also be ready to change that decision very, very quickly and not have any feelings about it. Right, So you don't want to get stuck. I know this thing is supposed to go up. I know it's going to go up. I'm sticking with that. No, nah, it's a bad way. That's a bad deal. Don't do that. Instead, find out why is it going against what I thought. Have the fundamentals changed? Have the, has the environment changed? Is there something you don't know? Well, if the trend is persistent, well, you, you, you need to change your thesis. Right? Your, your risk management needs to kick in and you decide, you know what, I, I think that uh, you know, things, things have changed, the tide has changed, so I need to re recalibrate. And we do that all day. We do that every day. Right? Somebody in my class over here you know, knows that I, I, will, I will usually send a message and say, this is, this is what I think. Right? This is what I think. And uh, many times we are right because we collectively analyze a lot of these things. So it's not just a one-person decision. It's where we're looking at several data points. And if things start to change, we are also very quick to make adjustments and say, you know what, I think, I think we hit max. I think we hit uh, uh, you know, that point of no return or, or the situation has changed, what we thought we would, you know, would happen uh, is not happening. If, for instance, on Friday, yesterday, I called for gap alert to close that gap, right? Well, guess what? We hit this and the market decided that's close enough. I'm on the 15 years. Yeah, the market decided that's close enough and did a rebound. Yeah, means that it hit the, the support level that had been created twice in the last one week. It hit this support level and bounced right back. There was not enough of a catalyst to go down and complete or fill that gap. That was the reasoning for that gap not being filled. Monday, do we have a reason to fill that gap? I don't know. Right? We'll see. That there, there are many things to look at in order to decide whether that gap uh, is going to be filled or not. Uh, and is that stop loss still one X? Uh, yeah, my stop loss is actually usually half X or one X. Usually half X. Right? Usually half X. My stop loss. I teach one X, uh, and I fluctuate between a half X and one X. The reason I do a half X is because if I collect premium of say one dollar, and now the value of my spread is one fifty, guess what? On ten contracts, that is a five hundred dollar difference. You with me so far? Yes. So a half X would be if I, if I closed it out at a half X, that's that's a five hundred dollar loss. Uh, if I close it out at one uh, X, that's a thousand dollar loss. So I prefer when I get more premium, I will go with a half X. When I get less premium, then I will go with a one X. 
And many, many times I also try not to depend so much on the market moving around. Here's the deal. If if you're not, if my position is not getting green within the first 10 minutes, guess what? I'm looking for ways to get out. I'm that impatient. I've been trying to buy patience. Uh, I've ordered it already from China, but uh, <laughs> you know, somebody told me, what did they tell me? Gummy bears. Yeah, 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 gummy bears. Somebody told me gummy bears have got patience in them. Uh, so yeah, ma'am, patience. I, I need patience, guys. Help me out. I, I need patience. But But here's the deal. If it's not performing well, and this is coming from experience, if it is not performing in the first 10 to 15 minutes, you are losing that money. That is my experience. So I don't wait for the stop loss. No. I don't wait for the stop loss. I get out and usually I'm going to get out with about a $50, $100 loss. Big deal. But guess what? It sets me up for a better position. So I have the buying power to do that many times. If you don't, if you have a PDT restriction, you may not. So you may have to either wait a little longer, or you know, hope that you're seventy, you're you're right seventy percent of the of the time. And I depend on that. I want to be right more than I'm wrong because if I'm wrong more times, then you know, I'm, this is not the business for me. So I try to adjust faster than than usual, faster than what most people would, because either I have uh, you know, a lot in stake. And by the way, the fastest way to lose money is to go huge. That's the fastest way to lose money. So as a regular trader, you should go small position sizes. And I do that. I practice that one, two, three contract. Every once in a while, I go five or 10. Uh, but it is never even close to 5% of my portfolio. So especially whatever size portfolio that you have, if you're practicing that, then it means that you're not allowing, you're not allowing any losses that you cannot recover from. And that's the most important thing. You don't want to experience a loss that you cannot overcome in the next trade. If it takes you five, six trades to come back and, and get that, recover that loss, uh, that was a bad deal. It doesn't matter, matter how much you, you know, were potentially going to make, uh, it's a really bad deal. So always watch that. It's more important to, you know, where you where you exit the trade than where you enter the trade. More important. Both are important, but it's more important. The risk management, I don't know who coined this, but I 100% agree with them. But the risk management starts before you enter the trade. Yeah, keywords, before you enter the trade. So if you don't have a clue about how you're going to manage that risk, uh, of the position that you're about to enter, stop, don't do it. You don't have a plan. So you need a plan of how to manage the trade before you enter the trade. Meaning that you, in your mind, you need to be crystal clear. If I'm getting a $1 premium and the value of this spread is now $1.30, what do I do? Do I wait? For it to maybe reach 140 and start thinking about whether to get out? Do I start looking at the market to see is this still a good trade? What do you do? Okay, that's you start making those kind of rules, write them down, post them on a sticky note, do something, but identify very, very clearly to yourself what you're going to do when the position is not going your way. Here's the other side of the story. If your position is doing well and say you received premium of $1 and now premium is at, say, 40 cents, this is going very well, what do you do? Do you take profit? Do you wait for it to go to zero and walk away? Or you know what, what, what exactly do you do? So for me, I've got very, very clear rules. If it has met my first expectation, which is to decay 50%, I'm taking that profit. Right, depending on the size of my position, I may take half. So, just to give you an idea, if I have say five contracts, I will sell three. Sorry, I'll buy back three, right? 
lock that profit in, and now I have two. And if price action is is you know still in my favor, I'll let it go a little bit further, you know, uh, further down. Uh, maybe pick it up at thirty cents or something like that. But if it starts going back up, I'm out of there like a bandit. I don't I don't argue. I don't say that. Yeah, yeah, it's got the potential. No, no, no. I'm not I'm not that good with a sling. Anybody know what a sling is? Right. Or stones, you throw a stone and you hit two birds. No, I'm not that good. No, no, I'm better with a cage. <laughs> I'm better with a cage. Just you know, set a trap, put something, put put some you know, some nuts in there. Let the bird come to you. Don't start throwing stones, man. That's I don't know. Yeah, so go the easy route. Just let the bird come to you. If it's already in the cage, just you know let it do its thing. So. I take those profits, oh, and why do I do that? Because I can do it again and again and again and again. If I only had to do one trade, then yes, I might be you know, a little lazy to come out, but then that exposes me to a lot more risk. So I prefer to actually you know, think two ways. One, like somebody who doesn't have a lot of money, and so you take what you get, but second, the grateful mindset where, you know what? I will take these, but I can do these again. So I'm always doing these again and again and again. So I ended up, you know, I end up taking maybe two or three trades. Uh, each trade giving me about, you know, three, $400. So if in a day I do, you know, about four trades, then I will walk away with about 1200 bucks, give or take. That's just on selling spreads. I haven't even sold calls and puts. I've been staying away from calls and puts. For the reason is that I've been getting burned a lot. This thing changes its mind every 20 seconds. That that's not that I'm, you know, it's new. It's it's always done that, but I've, I'm tired of just getting my fingers burned and giving fifty dollars, hundred dollars here and there. So I will go for defined risk, defined profit before I go for unlimited, unlimited profit. So when you buy a call, you actually have what they call unlimited. Because you, you you start to get to gain more, you can make a thousand dollars faster on a call than you can on a spread. Yeah, but then the risk is much much greater because you've got the risk of decay, especially because as a day trader I'm usually doing zero DT. By the way, when you're selling spreads, you don't want to do one two DT. You want to do zero. That's that's the deal. You do zero DTE. There are other strategies where you can do seven and 45 days, but that's a different story. It's possible. But uh, as a regular trader who's just doing zero DT selling spreads, then yeah, you, theta is your friend. Theta is definitely your friend. Uh, so because you're right over there, you're used to doing zero DT, then the likelihood of me doing zero DT calls and puts is very, very high. And I will usually, you know, I, you know, I do it. Uh, but I've been finding that I'm getting more success with defined risk. And it's taking only an hour. I can go get my coffee, come back and watch the trade. To me, that's more important than sitting where they're biting my nails and scratching the rest of my hair off. And then end up with a hundred bucks. Nah. No. No. So we're getting beyond that. So there, there are many ways to improve your game. Once you find your strategy, again, like I said at the beginning of the call, uh, stick with it, refine it, find ways to improve it, and and that and that's how I've been doing it. So, can you speak uh, to using a cash account? Like, cash account, yeah, yeah. And so if, with the like with the indices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So with a cash account, you can do cash account. You can do spreads only on indexes, on indices, right? You cannot do spreads on other things. So with a cash account, and that's the benefit of a cash account, is that you can trade every day, meaning that you don't have to worry about the pattern day traded rule. It's a FINRA rule. Uh, if you if you have, uh, let's, let's define uh, the amount of the account. Say you have $5,000 inside of your cash account and you sell, uh, you decide you, you, you're you going to sell five spreads. So how much do you need? They're five point wide. You need, you need $2,500, right? This is math in our heads. So you need, you need, 
$500 per spread on a five point wide on SPX and you are, your buying power is reduced by $2,500 immediately. Is it you with me so far on that, Erica? Yes. So if your spread is successful, well and good, you get to make money. For instance, let's say, you know, you, you, you know, on those five spreads, you make 50 cents. So you're good for 250 bucks. And now your account size is 5250. Uh, 52. can you do that again? You probably can. Should you? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But that $2,500 that of buying power that you received or, or that you used up, including the $250 in profit, is not available to you until the following day. All right? Until the following day on on indexes on indices, right? I call it index indices. I don't know. Uh, I think both are correct, but it's not available to you on uh, until the the following day. If it was an equity, that would be ah breaking news. It used to be two days. It used to be two days, and it is now twenty four hours or one day for equities. So now that playing field has been leveled. Did anybody else uh, get that email from uh, Schwab? You got, you got, Deborah, it looks like Deborah got it as well. So I received it too. You received it too, yes. So it used to be two days, 48 hours uh, for equities and 24 hours for indices. Now it's just 24 hours. So on a cash account, they made it even easier for people with cash account to trade every day. So, uh, final answer here is that if you trade with whatever buying power you have today on a on a on a cash account, it's not available for you to trade again until the following day. Right? Until the following day. If you wanted to get around that, you would need a margin account. Not that you're going to borrow money, but it's just a type of account. So with a margin account, in order for you to be able to trade every single day without worrying about your account being locked, you need at least $25,000, right? So that's the that's the major difference. And then of course, with a margin account, it means that you can do a lot more things. You can do you know, the same thing that you're doing on SPX, you can do it on QQQ or, or whatever other trade that you want to do, position, um, stock. So was there a specific thing that you wanted to find out about cash accounts other than those basics? No, you answered my question. Awesome, awesome, cool. So would I recommend a cash account? Um, it doesn't matter to me. If, if you have a strategy that uh, you can, that you want to take, you know, make use of every day, cash account is fine. Especially if you have less than 25K, uh, then a cash account is okay. So I've got several accounts, including a cash account that I've used successfully for a very long time. And if it, it has actually now grown to well over 25,000 and I haven't converted it to a margin account just because it, it works for me. Works for me. So uh, do I prefer margin over? Uh, I think with my portfolio, it I don't think it matters too much. And for most people, it shouldn't. So a cash account or margin account, for as long as you've got the correct trading privilege, then you're good. I would say that for most people, the appropriate trading privilege that, and when I say privilege, I don't mean that, you all understand what I'm saying. The, the correct trading permissions, it's, it sounds kind of sophisticated when I say privilege, but it's, <laughs> it's not. So, the appropriate privilege that you need in your account as a day and swing trader or an options trader is you need to be able to buy calls and puts. That's the first most basic privilege that you need. You need to be able to buy calls and puts. And I'm not talking about covered calls or covered puts, just straight call, straight put, that's number one. And then number two, you need to be able to do spreads. Right, so you need to be able to do spreads. So you need to be able to do a debit spread or a credit spread. Those are the two basic types of spreads. Everything else is usually a concussion or of of those combinations. Right, 
So as long as you can do calls, put spreads, you're good, right? So with a cash account, you can do calls and puts on anything. You can do spreads on just indices. You cannot do spreads on regular equities like Apple, Amazon, so on and so forth. But you can do SPX, which is what a lot of us trade. Uh, or you can do RUT, RUT, the Russell 2000. That's another one that uh, a lot of people have been seeing are favoring the RUT. Uh, did I say that correctly? RUT, RUT. Yep. Not RTY, by the way, Erica. RUT. I know you, uh, you've mentioned RTY. Say that again? I said not RTY. No, it's RUT. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. Because I think you, you had mentioned RTY the other day. So, uh, or well, somebody had so maybe. You mentioned RTY. I said I didn't know anything about RTY. I only know RUT. Oh, I thought it was the other way around. I thought I thought <laughs> you said RTY. <laughs> nope. <laughs> well, I think I had too much coffee. How about that? Or not? Or yeah, not I'll enough coffee? That. I'll go for that. <laughs> so Russell two thousand is another very eligible index that a lot of people go to. It, it has um, lower liquidity than. Uh, than SPX, but it's but it's good enough. So, uh, let's see what other questions are there. Anybody else got a question? And yes, I will post these on YouTube sometime today. Uh, I'm looking at the chat here. Nothing else. Actually, nothing on the chat. Okay. Excuse me. I have Eddie. a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question too. Um, earlier, when you were going over the SPX, and you said you went heavy, what what did you mean when you say you went heavy? Went heavy means that uh, I traded a few more contracts than I usually do. Gotcha. Yeah, appreciate it. I do have a maximum though. The maximum. The my maximum is ten. So if I'm going heavy, it means I'm probably closer to 10, sometimes seven. So, yep. If I'm trying to make 200 bucks, I don't go for 10. Uh, I have discovered that you can do some quick math. For instance, you can say that I just need to make $200, right? This is, I wanna make 200 bucks, don't have a lot of time, I see a potential where I can sell for 80 cents, wait for 10 contracts to decay 20 cents, and I have $200. Would that be, uh, mathematically, would that be correct? Yeah, that would be correct, yeah? Realistically, does it happen in a straight line like that? That answer is no. I've tried it, been there, done that. So if you want to grow to considerable sizes, and that's subjective, that's relative, you want to grow small. You don't want to grow big amounts at a time. They're stressful, you lose more, they fluctuate a whole lot more. In fact, if we were to plot our trading styles on a, on a, on a, on a chart like this one, it would be very, very erratic. You would notice that this chart would move up consistently when you're trading small and strategically. But when you're trading a lot of contracts, you'd see a whole lot more up and down movements. So I would say that as you build your strategy, define a number that is achievable to you based on your account, not based on your need at home or in your financial budget, but based on your account and your abilities and what strategies that you know and you have practiced and you have seen how they make money and you know how to do that. So usually people will try and learn how to make a hundred bucks and then try and improve that. So once you've done that, that's your step-by-step -step blueprint. What is the size of my account? What are my possibilities or capabilities? And then start going small. So the way I keep saying this for, for a lot of people, the way, the, the, the way to get to a hundred thousand is to make $500, $200, $300, $500, bucks, 1000 you know, every once in a while, but not 
ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars at a time. That is the fastest way to go negative. I've done it both ways, and I've discovered and proved that those small amounts, the two hundred, the three hundred, you, you don't you don't sniff at them. You don't turn up your nose at them. That's what that's how you get to those large numbers. Yeah. What's up, Marlon? I think you had a question too. Was it was it Marlon? No. I think that was me. Oh, okay. Yeah, my question was um, can you do put on a cash account? Yes. A straight put? Yes. Yes, you can do a straight put on a cash account. Uh, and you can also do put credit spreads or even debit spreads on uh, SPX on a cash account. Okay. So just make sure that when you log into your account, whether it's Schwab or, or TD Ameritrade, just make sure that you're allowed to do calls and puts. It is, I have never heard of anybody being able to do calls, not puts. Yeah, so, so you should be able to 100% uh, sure that you can do calls and puts if you have options trading privileges. That's the basic, that's the level one. If you have options trading privileges, yes, you can do puts and you can do calls. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which which platform are you on? Are you on uh, Schwab? CD. No, yeah, oh, Schwab. CD Ameritrade. Okay, uh, okay, good. Yeah. And you have a cash account? Yes. Have you done calls before? Yes, I, I do call all the time, but I think I try not to put and then it didn't go through. I don't know why. It's just like, that's why I was asking. Because every time I try not to do a put, it doesn't doesn't work. Okay. Uh, it, not sure what uh, what's happening there, but you, if you can do calls, you, you can do puts as well. Uh, just make sure that you're always clicking on the ask column. Yes, I know. Yeah, on the ask column, the one that says buy. So, yeah. So let me. Because I have two accounts. I have, uh, I have the, uh, um, uh, the, the other um, that we used to uh, use with um, Terry. Mm -hmm. But it's a margin. My margin account, I don't have any problem with that. Like when yep. I'm doing put, but okay. whenever I'm doing call on the CD Ameritrade, it doesn't, uh, I mean, the put, it doesn't go through. Mm. Well, hit me up this week. Let's take a look and see what's happening. Okay. Yep. Or you can uh, just uh, contact support. Uh, just push support over here and start a chat with them and say, I cannot do, or can I do puts? On this account and they will they will let you know either yes or no if it's a no they will tell you how to enable that if it's a yes then it could be something that you are doing on your side that's preventing that but in general if you can do calls you can do puts be sure about that okay mm -hmm. yep awesome thank you you are welcome well, it is uh, twelve thirty. Thank you so much for joining me here on Saturday. Uh, this is uh, Saturdays with Eddie. Uh, so you should say it's a pleasure to just uh, talk with you guys, uh, talk about trades and you know, stuff like that. I welcome your questions. If you have anything that you want to uh, uh, you know ask, you you definitely should ask. I encourage uh, if you're watching this for the am I? Yeah, I'm sharing it here. I forgot to tell you guys how to get a hold of me. Uh, options with Eddie here, right? Yeah. So if you if you need help, uh, if you need help or you want to join my class, this is how you do it. You simply go to Options with Eddie, and you can either set up a quick meeting and talk with me for about twenty minutes. Uh, let's discover whether this is for you or not for you. If you already know that this is for you, then you can push Sign Up. Uh, in a way, either the you know top right or or somewhere on the page, read about what you will learn. Uh, the format here is uh, pretty simple, very very basic. We do uh, we meet two times a week for about four weeks. So that's eight sessions. 
that's just the beginning of our relationship. That's where we start. And then from there, you join an alumni, a huge alumni of uh, students that I have taught over the last few years. Uh, these guys have become very, very sharp. They, they, they help out. They help a lot. Uh, they help each other. And you can pick up a lot of stuff. Now, in class, obviously, eight sessions is simply not enough. So I give you more. I give you... Uh, I give you a one-on-one -on -one at least, at least one or two sessions. Uh, I meet with you every Thursday morning. If you want to come join me, trade. Uh, we trade together on Thursday mornings at uh, 9 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, every other week, we meet on Wednesdays. Uh, sorry, not Wednesdays, uh, Thursdays. We meet on Thursday evenings every other week. Uh, sometimes we skip, but m we, we mostly meet. And then... Uh, again, uh, you, we can always collaborate 24 hours. There's people asking questions all time throughout the clock. Uh, this is what I will teach. This is more. This 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 this, this is kind of old. I need to update my website here. Uh, but you know, this is a program summary. At least you will know how to do that. The most important thing that that you will walk away with is uh, how to earn consistently from trading in the stock market. That's the most important thing that you're going to figure out. And it, because this is hands-on, more than likely by the end of the class, you will be able to be trading live. Even if you've been trading sim, I will guide you how to trade live and make sure that you're at least able to you know, get some money back. Okay. So that is optionswitheddy.com. Right. When does like, when does your next class start, Eddie? Monday. So I already have students lined up for Monday, uh, tomorrow, not tomorrow, today is Saturday. So so Monday I have a class. I keep my class size uh, no more than ten per class. Once the class reaches ten, then I start another one. So tomorrow's class is actually still open. Uh, it's not. I keep saying tomorrow. Monday's class is open. Uh, so I have uh, students who have already signed up. They've sent me payment already. Uh, and we start Monday at six o'clock p.m. Eastern time. So that's uh, that's the next class. I try to have at least one class every month. So, yeah. So if you have friends who need to join or who are on the edge, they're trying to make up their mind. Go ahead and push them this way, and I will pay you to. Uh, I'll give you. You can make money from me, by the way, by referring your friends. Uh, you can get 5% as a referral for each student and there is no limit. So, all right, good deal. Any any other questions? All right, guys. And well, how you... much is the course? I, well, yeah. the you in private or something? How much is the course? The course is... <laughs> uh, <laughs> The cost is 3500 bucks. Okay. Yes, it is uh, $3,500, uh, and it's eight one-hour sessions spread over four weeks, yes. So $3,500 is how much I, um, that's how much you get away with, so. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will you be able to make $3,500? I think you will. Fairly confident. Feel confident that uh, you will be able to make it right back. So, okay, yep. So you do you get there on pricing and any 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 button on the page that says sign up will will take you the same place. Really easy to sign up. Just just your name, your email, your phone number, and then you click the the options with any bootcamp. Uh, yeah, here's here's how to get your friend that five percent is you simply put in their name. There's no, there's no special code. So for example, see if uh, Deborah here, you know, is referred her friend, you know, just say, you know, Deborah uh, referred me and guess what? Deborah gets a Zelle from me. Does Deborah have Zelle? Deborah, do you have, I mean, Deborah, do you have Zelle? Yeah, you do. She has, you know, thumbs up. She will get a Zelle from me for, uh, and I do this quite a bit. She will get $175 from me. Imagine that. If you fast 10 of her friends, $1,750. All they have to do is let them know that when you sign up, don't forget 
don't forget just put in you know the name of their you know put it just just put in their name your friend's name and um I, I i know most students by name i think i know all students by name that's the beauty of uh that's the beauty of uh, having a small class i get to know you you get to know me we build rapport i know what your weak points are your strong points are and so i'm able to help you much much better with with your with your journey and, and that's you know, I prefer a 10 student size class or even one student as opposed to 500. I've done both. Uh, a lot of you I probably met in a school where there was 500 people in the class and you could barely, I mean, there, there, there were better chances of of a, of a fire alarm beep getting through than your question through. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll stop there. You all have a good afternoon. Thanks, Eddie. You too. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good one, Eddie.